Hello and welcome to Faith Matters. This is the program where we take a spiritual perspective on Merseyside life. And I'm here at the Mormon Chapel in Liverpool with David, Janet and Mark. Well, thank you very much for welcoming us to your building today. And can I start by just asking you to, I've introduced you, but to introduce yourselves and tell us a little bit, little bit about yourselves and what you do here in the chapel. David. Okay. Uh, my name is uh, David Hall. Uh, should I use my personal life? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm married to my wife, Karen. I have two daughters, Amanda and Sarah. Uh, born and raised here in Liverpool and have been a member of the church. Well, my parents converted to the church in 1965 when I was two and a half. So I've been coming here ever since. Uh, my job in the outside world is a finance manager for a local firm here in Liverpool. Um, education is important to us not only in the church but as a family and so my wife works in the primary school where my children went to in the school office. My eldest daughter is a primary school teacher teaching year five. My youngest daughter is in a high school teaching maths and I've been a chair of governors at that primary school for about 20 years. Um, I'm a Liverpool season ticket holder. Uh, and church-wise, my role, my title is the bishop, which means I am the local leader of the congregation here in Liverpool, uh, with a specific responsibility for the youth aged 12 to 18 to try and be a role model for them and help them to get through some of the challenges that exist in life. Okay, thank you, David. Janet? Okay, my name is Janet Gifford. I currently live in Wigan. I did go to college here in Liverpool. I studied in Liverpool. My family a ways back come from the Kirkdale and Toxteth area and I do have Mormons in my family from those areas as far back as 1864 um, in Liverpool. Um, I am a full-time civil servant working in Preston and uh, in my spare time I'm a political activist and a community activist. I'm a long-time church member and in that capacity I've held a lot of different roles within the church um, for many years. I was a music director. I'm now um, partially sighted and still continuing to go blind so um, really struggling to read music and indeed read anything else now uh, so I no longer do that. Um, in the past, I've served in leadership callings, mainly relating to uh, roles within the women of the church and that organisation, and also with the, serving with the youth of the church. I'm now serving within public affairs and finding that very rewarding. Thank you. Mark, tell us about yourself. I'm Mark Harrison. Um, I was born and raised in, in the church. I've been coming for 30 years. Um, up until recently I was an assistant uh, dementia trainer. I'm currently studying to be a, an actual trainer in that, in that industry. Um, my roles in the church have been uh, working with the youth, the youth programme. Um, it's been wonderful to be part of that organisation. I'm currently in what we call the Elders Quorum, which is basically a, a teaching role uh, within the, the organisation of the church, and we also try and help and strengthen the members. Okay, so the, the Mormons, the Church of the Latter-day Saints, um, tell us about it. I mean, our viewers won't know, I'm sure many of our viewers won't know too much about the Mormons. You know, tell us about the origins, uh, the background, founders, etc. David, would you like to okay. start? Um, generally, people refer to us the Mo as Mormons, but we are, in fact, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Uh, History-wise, would take us back to, back to the Saviour's time, but if I bring it a little bit more up to date being 1820, uh, a young boy in his four, 14 years of age uh, in the state of New York, a lot of excitement about religion. Um, so much so that while he was reading the Gospel of James, chapter 1, verse 5, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally, and braideth not, and it shall be given him, decided to uh, pray to the Lord, uh, and so went to a wood and offered up a prayer. Uh, and as a result of that prayer was visited by God the Father and his son Jesus Christ 
which then began the restoration of the church as in from being restored from the Saviour's time and so on the earth today we have a prophet named Thomas S. Monson and we also have 12 apostles okay um, tell us a bit more perhaps about uh, Liverpool the Mormons in Liverpool um, Janet do you want to you seem to you say you go back you know <laughs> hundreds of years or <laughs> decades at least and uh, not me um, personally I may look it what can you tell us about the Mormons in Liverpool right well it's interesting actually because uh, many people have uh, said to us over the years oh do you all like to go to Salt Lake as some kind of, of Mecca because they associate Mormons with Salt Lake City? Um, the answer to that question quite often is no. I think most Mormons haven't been to Salt Lake City and we don't really uh, sort of see it as a great Mecca, but it's strange. A lot of Mormons from Salt Lake City do see Liverpool in that role because the majority of people who live in the Salt Lake Valley have at least one or more ancestors who came either from Liverpool or through the port of Liverpool on the way to get there, to, to, to join that trek down to Salt Lake Valley. Um, a lot of the people there either came from England or from maybe the Scandinavian area and passed through this way. Um, when the church was starting to build up insufficient strength to be able to send its missionaries abroad outside of the United States this was the area that, that they felt they should first come and proselyte in so they started in the northwest of that's, England. That's reaching people. Yes. Yeah, okay. yes, yes. When they first felt that they wanted to carry the, the message further um, they prayed about where they should go and they felt that the northwest of England was the area that they wanted to reach um, so they did start to bring the message to this area and largely to um, Liverpool and Preston and the areas in between. They came here, um, they were so excited that the first missionary here, which was the very first person to set foot on English soil, was Heber C. Kimball. He was so excited he didn't even wait for the ship to dock, he actually jumped overboard to be the first person to reach Liverpool and uh, sort of um, splashed into the water. He was, he was okay, so excited. He, <laughs> <laughs> he was more than okay. He yeah. was full of fire. He was very excited about coming to Liverpool. Um, some of the people that arrived with him, as about half a dozen missionaries came together. Um, some of them already had relatives here or had recommendations from people who had relatives here and they went to those people first, those families first and contacted them and they were very excited to hear that message and many of those joined and, and contacted other friends. Some of them, um, I think most of them were already active Christians in other congregations and they invited the missionaries to come and speak in their own churches, which they did, some of which are still standing in Liverpool. Um, I think one of them is actually now a pub but still has the pulpit in it. Um, the nightclub or something that still has the pulpit there. Um, that was one of the places they preached from and there are still a lot of historic places still standing in which those early missionaries still preached and um, yeah they, they built up quite a considerable um, congregation from members that were baptised here um, so much so that they were able to build um, um, a, an immigration office and as members from other parts of the country, particularly from Preston and a very small village nearby called Downham, up near the Pendle Hill, bottom of Pendle Hill, where almost 100% of that village actually were baptised, the village completely emptied. You know, um, they decided that they got baptised and wanted to emigrate and join the rest of the saints in America. They wanted to emigrate and they came to Liverpool and people would stay in the accommodation nearby. The church was able to fund the buying uh, of some properties there where people were able to stay, prepare to, to emigrate, to get the documents together that they need, to learn about how to set up life in the new world. And Over in the States? Yes, yes. And so they lived in Liverpool for a while. And, and the first em immigration office, emigration immigration office, was set up here um, by the church. And that's um, stayed here for a long time. 
and people went from Liverpool to there. Well, that's that's interesting. So, Mark, very briefly before we come to our break, you know, how many people do you get in here on a Sunday? Um, what is Sunday, you meet, is it? Yeah, we meet on Sundays at ten in the morning. Um, I actually attend the the ward in Crosby. Right. Okay. But uh, Bishop, I could answer you. We, we yeah. would get about one hundred and fifty people. Here so you, you're pretty much full, really. Yeah. Uh, yes, the chapel park can take to about 250 people, and then we can extend back if we need to. But on a general Sunday, we would have 150 people. There. I have 600 members of the church here in Liverpool. Mm. Well, thank you. We're going to cut now to our commercial break, and then when we come back, we're going to talk about some more uh, themes connected to Mormonism. Faith Matters. We're here in the Church of Jesus Christ and the Latter-day Saints in the chapel uh, in Liverpool with David, Janet and Mark. Um, I must ask you about this, is that I understand that uh, Donny Osmond has actually been uh, to this chapel. Is, is that correct? Yeah. Or is that a myth? Uh, the Osmond brothers right, okay. have actually been here to this chapel and one of uh, the siblings actually served a mission here. Uh, Donny Osmond has been to obviously the Echo Arena a couple of times, uh, but in my recollection, I'm not aware that Donny has actually been here into this building. Someone we may correct me, uh, and certainly some of his fans may say, Oh, no, he's definitely been here, but I'm not aware that he's actually been inside. Actually, Jimmy did work at a temple for a while, didn't he? That's correct. Mm. And he, he sang a song about Liverpool, of course. Yeah. 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 What was that song? Can you remember? Long heard Liverpool. Long heard yeah. Liverpool. Yeah. 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 I was saying that in the break that Mark <laughs> wouldn't have remembered anything about it. Like, <laughs> my mother's educated. Right, yeah, your mother's educated. <laughs> okay, now, touching on kind of myths um, mm. that are around. Now, a lot of people think that uh, Mormons practice polygamy. That's um, having more than... Uh, a man having more than one wife or as many wives as they they want uh, I understand that that is no longer true for mainstream Mormonism David uh, that is very true we do not practice polygamy uh, there are more than 15 million members of the church worldwide and not one of those is a polygamist okay so when we hear about you know names from the states we read about them in the in the in the in the press or see them on the media pe people like Warren Jeffs would be the with the classic example. They're they're not no, officially they're not. members of the church. No, they're not. So they're kind of like a breakaway mm. sect. They really. are yes, and they certainly wouldn't rececognise. I mentioned Thomas S. Monson before. They wouldn't recognise him as the prophet. Okay, and um, so Warren Jeffs is a prophet in his own right, in his own understanding. Correct. Okay, uh, so but you there was a history, obviously, of polygamy at one point in the history of the church yes very in the ve very very early days particularly as the pioneers those members that janet spoke about traveled across uh, the american continent to get to salt lake but it was for a very short period of time um, and i remember it would be 1890 when polygamy was officially mm -hmm. stopped in the church yeah it's interesting i mean to be fair to the mormons i mean it's not the only religious tradition that's practiced polygamy and indeed in Africa today, you know, there are mainstream Christians that mm. practice Correct. polygamy. Yes. So, um, you also, you don't uh, drink, smoke, uh, or even drink coffee. And uh, Mark, uh, how are you coping with that? <laughs> <laughs> with coffee, anyway. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, uh, through the prophet Joseph Smith, our founder, um, the Lord gave him uh, a law of health to teach to the members, to teach to the saints of the church. And it's uh, foods and drinks which are good for us and things that we should abstain from. Uh, this is in an effort to, to help us in our, in our journey through life. It's to help us stay healthy. And it's also for our spiritual protection. You know, the Lord promises us blessings for, for abstaining from things like tea and coffee and alcohol. And uh, Bishop mentioned Thomas S. Monson. Um, through modern day prophets that we have today, uh, this law also extends to things like, um, you know, illegal drugs or yeah. the, the abuse of, of proper medical drugs. You know, also to abstain from from abusing drugs like that. So it's it's tea, and <coughs> coffee, uh, uh, alcohol, alcohol, and tobacco. Okay, and yeah. you've done none of these things. Never, yeah. never. Amazing, amazing. 
Um, another one of your traditions is, I think, I think I'm getting this right, is um, the ba baptism of the dead mm. by proxy. So, uh, can can you explain that? I don't know whether it, David wants to do this or Janet. Explain that to us. Would you go? Yeah, you go. Okay. <laughs> um, if we go back to the New Testament times mm. when. Uh, Paul had his epistle to the Corinthians we hear of baptisms for the dead and in chapter 15 verse 29 there's a reference to it uh, and so as a church because of as I mentioned earlier on we strong family ties um, we do family history which encourages us to perform a labor for our family in order to have proxy baptisms we believe that as the Saviour's taught everyone needs to be baptised and we believe whether in this life or the next that is still the case and so in order for our generations to accept the gospel in the next life if they choose to we then do those proxy baptisms on the basis that they can still have their choice to be members of the gospel. So when you say choice when people pass over from death Yes. to the other side. They then have a choice then, do they? Correct. Uh, I don't think that's so unusual. If you think about it, many mainstream churches will baptise a baby who isn't at that stage in life able to choose whether to accept a christening or not. Yeah. But you will have godparents who will make a promise on behalf of the child. And then when the child is old enough to choose it will then decide whether to honour those vows or not. Yes, well, so in a sense, we think about it, when we make a promise on behalf of an ancestor who may have lived several hundred years ago, and were, who is not physically present, and we promise on behalf of that ancestor that we will follow Jesus Christ, we will honour this baptism, that ancestor then is in the same position where later on, at the time of resurrection, they can decide whether they're going to honour the promise that we've made on their behalf so there is that precedent that they are simply choosing later whether to make and honour um, the promise that we've made on their behalf just as a godparent would yes yeah, well it's what we call covenant mm -hmm. theology so you're making a covenant yes. Yes. on yes. behalf Very of that yes. of that child yes. so do you do you baptize by full immersion or yes, when you do, do baptize do. by full so you, do. you've got a Baptism. I don't know whether you call it a baptism tank here. Yeah. Baptism Some font. Yeah. Font. Yes. And um, and so when you baptise by proxy, somebody else yeah. will be baptised on behalf of or perhaps on behalf of a family member. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, that's interesting. And, and so, what about the role of women in the church? Um, how, you know, how is it? How is that structured? You know, it's very similar to the role of men, in so much as we fast, we pray, we tithe, we um, attend our church meetings, we attend the temple, we strengthen families, we strengthen communities, we do very much the same things. Um, we follow Jesus Christ. Now the men, um, they have the priesthood, so <laughs> which is probably where you're driving okay so they are structured um, by the priesthood and they follow, they hold those offices and they have um, a quorum of priesthood with, within which they work the women have a relief society we have a sisterhood we have a quorum within which we work I mentioned that earlier when I said I've had leadership callings within the sisterhood of the church relief society is the oldest women's organisation in the world 1842 that was established we have I don't know five or six million members worldwide so it's also the largest women's organisation in the world and uh, we're all quite proud to be members of that I certainly am and that is structured in a very similar way to how the priesthood structure themselves so within um, a chapel you will get maybe a bishop who will have two councillors, they'd be like assistant bishops, and then he'll have a number of officers that serve under him. In the Relief Society, you will have a woman who is the president, she will have two councillors, assistants, and you'll have a number of officers and teachers who serve under her. 
they will then perform their work within that quorum in exactly the same way. And we have responsibilities that, again, will be spiritual responsibilities and which are practical, temporal responsibilities. The Relief Society was established, like I say, in 1842, originally as, as the name suggests, as a relief organisation. It goes back to the building of the temple at Nauvoo, where um, we had manual workers uh, labouring in the cold to build a massive temple uh, where the hands were getting scratched, they were going without meals, the families were at home wondering when they were going to see the husbands and so forth. Um, so the society was hastily put together to try and make sure that uh, they were warm, that they were fed, that um, safety equipment was provided and then to go and look after the families and make sure that they were okay, they were safe, they were uh, emotionally supported and from there it then became important also to look to the spiritual needs of those people and then from there to look to the needs of the community and then it widened and the brief became bigger and bigger. So the, these are like a parallel orders are they? Yes. The priesthood and are they yeah. the female relief or, society. Or relief society. We, work, we work together mm. and that's why as far as the women are concerned the majority of women and have no interest and this this has been polled within the church we've done polls on this in the church but women are not interested in the majority in ever having the priesthood because we have relief society we have the sisterhood which is a parallel organization all the tools that we need to do the job we want to do we have we have almost a mirror organization to do the job that we need to do more than happy with it and the work that we get done is phenomenal everyone that's in relief society is more than happy with what we achieve and i would add keith on a sunday for our sunday meetings mm -hmm. the women can give talks can give prayers Sorry. it's not just led by myself yeah okay you come to our sunday meetings and i've been to sunday meetings the men well as as we say sometimes quite young young men you know will be blessing the bread and the water and passing it around and that's quite often the youth rather than the men that do well, that. Well we're going, we're going to come to that in a moment. We're going to cut now to another break and when we come back we're going to be talking to Mark about what it's like to be a young person in the church and then over to David um, in terms yeah. of the support. So join us after the break for Faith Matters. back to Faith Matters. We're here in the Mormon Chapel in Liverpool with David and Janet and Mark. And uh, Mark, I'm going to talk to you now about, you know, what, what's it like being a young person in in this church? Because we've talked about how, you know, you don't drink, smoke. Yeah. I mean, there are other people of other religious traditions that don't do these things. But, you know, what's it been like over the years? You know, take me back to, you know, school days and... So, um, do you know I'm a, I'm actually really grateful that I've been blessed to grow up in the Liverpool area because it is it's quite rich and diverse. I have friends of of lots of different faiths, and I've got friends who are quite secular in the beliefs. Uh, thankfully, growing up in the church, you know it's been very um, you know obviously you, you get like the peer pressure that every child or every youngster goes through no matter what background they come from. Um, my faith in God has helped me to get through any kind of anything like that. But I'm also grateful because of because of where I live in Liverpool. All my friends of different faiths and secular beliefs, wherever we all su love and support each other. You know, uh, as we mentioned before, we have a youth program. I used to come to the the youth mutual evening, which happens at Tuesdays, at uh, seven thirty p.m. I'd bring my friends along with me, for no matter what background they came. Everybody's welcome to our church. Um, and you know, going through school, I had I had the same group of friends. Um, you know, I think certainly something I believe in is the power of prayer. You know, I'd always pray for help, and I felt that very much I got that help. You know, as long as we focus on the, the major, the key things of, our, of, of, of a, a testimony or faith that keeps me strong personally is uh, I say my prayers. You know, I talk to my Heavenly Father, uh, read the scriptures, and I attend the church meetings as well so we can come to, you know, people of a like mind and be strengthened in that respect. Um, once I got out of school and I was in college, 
um, very much the same thing. You know, I've just been I've been blessed to be surrounded by people who have always been very supportive. You know, you, you do meet people who who feel that I'm approachable enough to say, well, actually, I oppose these beliefs. But you can you can talk about things, and I learn things from them. They learn things from me. And for 18 plus, we also have another kind of um, social and teaching gathering here at the chapel at 7:30 on Thursdays, where we all, we we talk about contemporary moral issues. We learn about uh, more things about about the saviour. You know, so growing up in the church, it, it's been an interesting experience. Yeah. But it's been a positive one on the whole. I feel. Uh, and so, yeah, this is the city of banter, isn't it, Liverpool? Yeah. And it, it is. It is. <laughs> the city. I mean, what, what you say about you know support and yeah. friendship and tolerance. It is a very tolerant place. Yeah. And, you know, maybe that's why so many Mormons settled here in the first place. But uh, because it, it's well, perhaps always been like that to, to a greater or lesser extent. But it is the city of banter as Definitely. well. So you have probably had your fair share of banter. Oh here. yeah, yeah. I um, mean, um, but you know, it's you take it on the chin. I know. I know that people, for the most part don't mean it personally no you know and, and I think you know I, I think if you, you need to you need to laugh at yourself you know there's parodies on everything and it's a good learning opportunity for people who sometimes these jokes are, are an opportunity to, to talk about these things because I, I believe that behind that there's there's an element of I wonder what is going on behind this this joke I've pulled or you know people might make a joke about polygamy or whatever and then you know it always leads into a, a conversation where yeah. we talk about things yeah. like this. E everything's an opportunity to share the gospel. I feel. Okay, and uh, so you, you talked about bringing friends to yeah. to your youth activities. Have you ever seen anyone converted, friend, or anything like that, or know know of anybody? Is that, yeah. is, that a co is that a common thing? You know, it happens. It happens often. Yeah. I mean, um, when I was young, that wasn't really in the front of my mind. I just no. wanted to bring my friends with me, but. Um, you know, I'm grateful that people have been, they've observed the kind of life that we live and they've found that attractive and they've been able to gain those blessings from, from our Heavenly Father. You know, and yeah, like we mentioned before, everybody's welcome. You know, you don't need to be a Mormon to, to come into this building and, to, and just to find out about what we do and to learn about what we teach, you know. Okay, that's great. Uh, over to David now, you were saying that, you know, one of your responsibilities here is, is the care of young yes. adults. Um, you know, what's the... You know, how do you approach this? Um, I meet here with them on a Tuesday evening. So as Mark made reference to their activity night. And so they'll come along on a Tuesday night. I also have the opportunity to spend time with them during our services on a Sunday. Um, as part of their general life, uh, they'll have an interview with me on each of their birthdays, just to see how they're doing in life in general. How's school doing? How's family? How's life in the world? Um, and hopefully they then relate to some of the, the experiences that I've been through and I can guide them through that. They're, again, they have their free agency, but our role is to try and support them and to be there and to try and still be young at heart. Uh, that's not always easy when they're playing maybe basketball or some of the sports that, that go on, but yet yeah, to really just be involved with them. Okay, now... I mean, Mark has said that he's he's stayed within the kind of boundaries of of the faith, as it were. Yes. There's obviously going to be young people who stray beyond those boundaries. How do you deal with that? Uh, again, in trying to teach the principles of the gospel, we believe most definitely in repentance, and there are times when perhaps uh, because of their age, they do some things that are contrary to what the church teaches. That will allow them to come in certain cases to come and talk to me as a bishop and to be able to go through some of those things and my endeavour is to help them repent and to feel forgiveness from the Lord not from myself I don't extend forgiveness that's not my role uh, and for them to hopefully still stay with us um, but you're quite right and it always amazes me actually on the re reverse role when people of 16 and 17 and 18 actually leave the world as such and come and join us mm. they like that sort of what we offer compared to what the world is offering. Yeah. Okay, and what about social media and computers and yeah. all that? You do that kind of thing? Yeah, 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 I'm on Facebook and Twitter and all the yeah. all the generic sites. <laughs> Just like everybody else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah. 
You can get carried away with that kind of thing, though. Oh yeah, I think um, you know I, I allocate some time to check it from time to time, but uh, I, I don't. I'm not one of these people who are, who are on it all day. Okay. You know, <laughs> <laughs> too much to do. Right <coughs> now, tell us about the missions. You you all go on. Is it two year? Yeah. Missions. Yeah. You, you you've obviously done that, Mark. Have you? Yes. 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 I went to. Um, I served in what we call the the London South mission. So that's everywhere um, below Oxford in the UK. Right, so you didn't go anywhere exotic? Or oh no, no, no. Um, I haven't got the skin for yeah, that. <laughs> <laughs> Some uh, people do. I mean, they go all yes, over the world. Yeah, they yes. Go. Um, <laughs> I went to the east coast of Canada, and we have missionaries all over the world, um, and particularly from here in Liverpool. We've mm. we've sent them to quite the Philippines. And yes, the Philippines <laughs> currently, um, and so, and it isn't a case of because I noticed that you said we all go on missions. Uh, one of our earlier prophets, President David O. McKay, counselled us as members that every member should be a missionary. But we do have full-time missionaries, where, as you mentioned, they are called to serve for whether it's 18 months, maybe two years, mm -hmm. and some older married couples, um, and they go out, serve full-time in those various parts of the world to bring the message of the church to the people who want to listen. I mean, I, I bumped into some guys as I came through. They kindly showed me through. They were mm -hmm. one of them is American. Yes. And, um, so, is this a base for Janet? Is this a base for uh, missionaries? Are they based here, or they just happen to be here today? They just happen to be here. We we have them spread widely throughout the world. Are their actual base is Altringham, I think. Okay. So we have we have uh, maybe two, four in each of the towns all over the country. Yeah, they're, they're everywhere. I'm blessed. <laughs> we, we have eight. They live wow. here in, in the Liverpool area. But as Janet says, their yeah. actual base, the person who looks after them, is based over in Altringham. Mm. Uh, and I have people from China, uh, from London, mm. from the States, from France, serving here in the ward. And they'll, they could be here. Their transfers are every six weeks. So they could be here for six weeks, they could be here for a lot longer, and then they rotate around what we call the England-Manchester mission, and so it covers the northwest area. Uh, how, how do you think uh, they're received on the doors? I mean, is it changed or...? Um, I suppose it's changed in that there's very little done actually on the doors. Mm. We've always been known as perhaps the two gentlemen in the suits going around the yeah. streets and knocking them up. That's very rare now. They, they spend more time, and so for, for my eight, uh, they will do two or three street meetings a week. So they'll go to the city centre uh, and we'll just stop people and say to them, what do you know about the church? Or do you believe in Christ? And start a conversation from that point of view, invite them to come along on Sunday and to meet with us and to largely see who we are. And does that have traction? That Do you find that works? Yes. Yeah, far, far more so. Far just more just so. trying to get some tips, you know, for my work. Yeah, yeah, yeah <laughs> no. far more so. I mean, the real key is us as members. Yeah. It's far easier if we can get a family member or a friend and introduce them to the missionaries because that person already knows us. But yes, sitting doing the street meetings has, has, has proved a great success for them. Okay. And Mark, just before we come to yeah. our, our last break, um, do you, when your friends go out to places, do you go out with them? Uh, I don't really go to like clubs or pubs or anything yeah. like that. You know, we're um, you know we're, we're told in our church to, to stand in holy places, as it were. You know, yeah, yeah. not to go anywhere that might interfere with being able to feel the spirit. You know, but my friends are uh, they they accept that about me, and we you know we uh, we meet up and I go to their home or or wherever. But we you still go out for a meal or something. Yeah, like we still make round. Yeah. 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 Um, bit of sport or something like definitely that. Yeah. yeah 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 you know it, it hasn't affected my social life in any negative way whatsoever but um yeah it's 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 a it's a wonderful it's a wonderful experience and and you know touching upon what we can do as members and, and like growing up and uh, with regards to our social life we mentioned social media before that's one of the ways in which we as as members can do our missionary work as well is we share things like that. Okay, thank you, Mark. We're going now uh, to our break, and then when we come back, uh, we're going to talk about a relationship between the church and, and other churches and mainstream Christianity. Mm -hmm. So join us after the break for Faith Matters.
Welcome back to Faith Matters where we're at the Mormon Chapel in Liverpool with uh, Mark and Janet and David. Um, I'm going to come to perhaps the trickiest line of questioning now. Um, one of the things, I've, this is the second time I've been here, and one of the things that struck me is actually how much you know, I have in common with you really and my, as we talk about faith and we talk about spirituality. But the Christian church, the mainstream Christian church, hasn't always considered Mormons and the Church of Jesus Christ and the Latter-day Saints to be properly Christian. That is true, isn't it? It is. However, we are Christians. Uh, we recognize most definitely that the Savior Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Uh, we are followers of Jesus Christ uh, and as a result try to live our lives uh, following his teachings and by keeping his commandments. Uh, not always easy. Um, but we do our best and certainly on a Sunday a central part of our church service would be the sacrament in remembering the Saviour Jesus Christ. And in your sacrament it's, it's bread and water? It I is correct. Is, and is that is, is the water because you don't drink wine? Correct. So it's the alternative to yes. drinking wine but it's more mu much the same thing really? Correct. Mm -hmm. And, and every, every Sunday you do this? Every Sunday. Okay so Janet you know, over the years, if you have people sort of say to you, and I don't know, maybe it's in a nasty way, you know, you're not a proper Christian, have you ever had that kind of thing? Yeah, I went to a church school, and I went to um, a church college. I got that all the time. Right, and yeah. how, how did you cope with that? I found it very puzzling. People say Mormon, you know, but we are the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and the clue is in the title, it's right there in the name and how obvious can it be we, we are Christian we, we testify of Christ everything that we do I'd like to think we testify of Christ the Book of Mormon if you look at the front cover it says the Book of Mormon another testimony of Christ mm. you know, we, I don't know how clearer we can be Okay, c coming to the Book of Mormon, mm. um, that's you know, a nice segue there to uh, <laughs> introduce the Book of Mormon. Um, yeah. Now, some Christians would say um, that you've added to the Scripture, you know, uh -huh. where it says in the New Testament, if anyone adds to this, you know, let them be damned that's or whatever right. it is it <laughs> says, to let them be judged accordingly. Yeah. Some would say that by having that extra book, the Book of Mormon, yeah. is actually, that's the offence if you like, you're adding to scripture, um, yeah. but you do hold the Book of Mormon of, 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 on an equal footing with the Bible, don't you? Yeah, so how would you address that when somebody would say that to you? Uh, well, we recognise the Bible as the Word of God, mm -hmm. and we utilise the King James Version, we accept its teachings, as Janice has mentioned, we have the Book of Mormon which on the front cover says another testament of Jesus Christ, they go side by side. We don't believe that the Book of Mormon dilutes the Bible, we believe it expands it. Um, and yes, people will make that reference largely from revelations in the New Testament, oh, no more books. But of course that reference is also made in Deuteronomy, yeah. which is very early on in the Old Testament. And so do we then discount mm. all the other books after that? In fairness, most of the books of the New Testament were added after that was made as well. <laughs> Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, that's, a, that's, a good, <laughs> yeah. that's a good point. And uh, the other argument that people would come up with is that you're like the Unitarians. You're not. You're openly not Trinitarian. Can, uh -huh. can you? I mean, for a lot of our viewers, we won't have a clue even what that means. Mm. Um, um, I don't know who wants to go for this one. Um, Mark, do you want to have a go at this? Okay. You know, what does it mean to be not Trinitarian? And uh, you know, maybe David would like to come or, or Janet and talk about how, how you would defend that against, you because know, the, mar the marker of sort of mainstream Christianity, historical Orthodox Christianity, yeah. has been, the, you know, an understanding of the Trinitarian faith. Mark. Okay, so as Christians we believe in God, the Father, we believe in His Son, Jesus Christ, and in the Holy Ghost. We believe them to be three individual people, three individual beings who work together in unity as one Godhead. We say Godhead instead of Trinity. The Trinity, as, as, you, as you know, is uh, the belief that all three of these beings are, are one, one being. We believe them to be individual, individuals that work in unity with one will and one purpose. And that's the major difference, I just mean, in a nutshell. 
I mean, you know, I'll probably get told off about this later, but that sounds like semantics to me. You know, I've been told off by my bosses. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, David. You know, what, you know, what what would you say to that? You know, how do you counter that when when people say that? Um, I mentioned earlier on when we talked about Mormonism, where did it start? Mm. The Prophet Joseph Smith. We believe, we recognise that when Joseph went and prayed, he was visited by two beings. God the Father and his Son Jesus Christ uh, and that is a, a basic fundamental principle of the gospel that then we'll find there are two people uh, along with the Holy Ghost um, and we recognize that that doesn't fall in line with a lot of people but we recognize as Mark has actually said it's that one will and one purpose with just three individual beings okay I, I read a ma uh, magazine, an American magazine called Christianity Today, um, and I'm, from my reading of that magazine, I'm aware that in the States there's been conversations, quite high level conversations between Mormons and evangelical Christians about points of, as we talked about earlier, about common ground. I mean, are you familiar with that? Uh, and there's been a kind of a, a more of a reproachment to coming together that... Uh, Maybe it's a political thing, yeah. Mitt Romney and so on. But um, I'm not necessarily aware of myself, I don't know if anybody else is, uh, but I am aware of my father when he was alive, uh, served as a lay minister in Walton Prison and was part of their sort of economical society in that they all then recognised each other's values mm. uh, and would often, after having done their visits, spend some time together just sharing each other's views. Um, and often realising that there are an awful lot of matters that we do align ourselves with in quite a lot of areas. Okay, I don't know, does anybody else want to add to that at all? Um, I work in Preston and a lot of my colleagues are Muslim and I find when we start to have discussions about my faith and theirs, we find more points of similarity than we do different mm. differences because um, there are so many po similar points of faith and so many similar standards. And I find that with many religions, when you stop worrying about what the differences are and start looking at the similarities, that's a big tick list of similarities. Yeah. 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 I think it's always best to start with common ground. Yeah. Yes. Um, There's a lot and, of common and, ground. And friendship. Yeah. Now, yeah. Janet, I, I know that you said you were, you know, uh, you, you were a community involved with community yeah. activism. One of the things that really intrigued me, talking to your husband, actually, was that you're actually involved in quite left-wing politics, aren't you? Um, <laughs> is it left unity or something? <laughs> I, I was quite surprised by that, because I, I, I perceive m yeah. Mormons to be quite conservative as, people. As, as a church spokesperson, I cannot possibly comment. If you wish to see me privately, <laughs> I would be more than happy to... Uh, regale you with my left-wing policies. Okay, but, it, but it's, it's, it's okay for, the, for yeah. church members to be involved in any form Yeah, the of church position is, it's on the website, mm. a great, a great um, uh, resource for anyone who wants to know about uh, any church policies is to look at mormon.org and we do have a statement on there about our politics which is that we have no politics. It says on there that we encourage members to get involved in the political community uh, we're, we're part of the world, we need to be having a say in it, um, we are encouraged to be active, but the church has no preference as to party or angle or policy uh, or whether you're left, right, centre or whatever, so it does not support any particular candidate or any particular party in any particular country, mm -hmm. so you can be wherever you want to be, and it is a bit of a misnomer. <laughs> Yeah, we, we, it is a misnomer that we have a preference. We have had and do have yeah. MPs in different parties, yeah. local councillors, members yeah. of the church who have served as mayors. Yeah. It's their choice. I think we have two MPs, don't we? And, and it's one Labour and one Tory. One on each side. One of each. <laughs> yeah. There's not many Liberal Democrats who refuse to have one of those at the moment, <laughs> but you never know. I would, so I would love, sure to, be, I would love to be the first uh, Left Unity MP, yeah. but I don't think it's going to happen. <laughs> Okay, and so you've got a website. That yes, we do. Yeah. The address? Mormon.org, which perhaps is strange when you know, we've tried to stress the name of the Church of Jesus Christ and the Saints, but we do recognise that the people who want to find out about us do see us as Mormons. So Mormon.org, find out about our beliefs, where we meet, how you can get a copy of the Book of Mormon, how you can meet up with the missionaries. 
while I'm there. Okay, it's been great to be with you today. I mean, I think one of the things I've come away with is that um, you know you're normal people, really. Uh, not that I I'm not not really expecting <laughs> <otherwise. laughs> and uh, you know people have all sorts of perceptions and uh, and misperceptions mm. uh, about faith communities. You know, my own, my own included, and. Uh, you know, this program really is all about um, busting some of those myths mm -hmm. open. So thank you very much for inviting us here today. And um, I shall come back and visit you for a service, I'm sure. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. So thank join you. us uh, next time for Faith Matters on Bay TV.